wax and they would strip them and uh, dampen it and, and make a ball. Um, and, you know, it was just, it was so important to them. Um, and it continued to be throughout um, Lefty's life in Cuba. Um, and, and her brother was also a good ball player. Tell us what was going on in Cuba at that time uh, and then at the time for her departure. Yeah, um, and in um, uh, in the forties, and, and we're talking in the you know again the, you know early forties, uh, early to mid forties, um, uh, the uh, uh, the dictator Batista was in power, and the and and he was of course a, a, a dictator that was uh, backed up by the United States. Lefty's father was uh, what she called a policeman for Batista. Uh, and was very loyal to Batista. Um, and so for a period of time there, um, it, they, they experienced and, and actually enjoyed a, a level of, uh, you know, middle class respectability, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously uh, Batista lost power uh, on more than one occasion. And, and the first time uh, her father uh, lost that job. And, um, uh, they were, they were very, um, they were, I don't want to say poor, but their, their standard of living really declined. And it was then that a lefty's mother had to go to work, which was not something go to work outside the home. And that was not something that she ever saw herself doing. Um, and, and, and so the family really suffered um, and as we move forward in that story, eventually Lefty's brother actually fought with Castro. Um, so we have her father, a supporter um, of, of Batista um, early on, and then her brother uh, fighting um, for the rebels um, along with Castro. And so that gives you an idea of the difficulty of, in that family. Sure, sure. And so how many years did she play? organized baseball before uh, before kind of joining up with the uh, the professional team from the United States and, and having that exposure. Right. Um, well, Lefty played, um, uh, actually, Lefty was a very good athlete. She was, she fenced. Uh, she was a very good volleyball player. She was, uh, she loved volleyball. She played basketball. She played a lot of sports. Um, her early days playing baseball were not necessarily on an organized team. As I say, she played in the street. She played with, you know, the kids in the neighborhood or whatever. Um, her mother got word that the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League was coming to Havana in 1947 for spring training. And so what was happening then was a... Uh, uh, a beer merchant, um, a businessman in the area uh, named uh, De Leon, put to, was putting together a women's baseball team. And they were to be on the order of the All-Americans. The uniforms were similar. They were dresses and they played with the same rules. And so the, the theory was, the thought was they were going to create this team, uh, the um, Cubanas, and then they would play the All-Americans when the All-Americans came in, um, in, in spring of 47. Um, her mother found out about it. And Lefty tells the story that she was out in the street playing ball one day. And, and her mother came out and said, come on, you have to get dressed. We're going. Um, and she took her to this tryout. She didn't even know it was happening. Uh, she took her to this tryout and uh, he, De Leon said, you're a ball player. I'm going to, I'm going to make you into a ball player. And it was he who actually bought her first glove for her. Um, so it wasn't it, in terms of an organized team, it really wasn't until maybe nine months, year before, uh, 47. And then she played with the Cubanas. And then, uh, when she was recruited, she was still a little young. So, um, they, uh, they, they told her she had to wait to the next year, but what she did was play in an exhibition tour that went to some other Latin American countries. So her organized, um, baseball was really just a year or two before she joined the all Americans and then, and then, uh, started playing with them. So let me ask you one question about the history of baseball in Latin America. And then let's, let's go to, uh, to the United States. 
Sure. What introduced uh, baseball into Latin America? Was that from the United States or? Well, sort of. Um, there were two, um, two young men, brothers, who went to college in the United States. This would have been in the latter part of the 19th century. And they were introduced to baseball while in the U.S. And when they came back to Cuba, they brought with them a ball and a bat. And they were the ones who introduced baseball to Cuba. And it became, it grew, and, and people loved it. And, and th there are so many reasons that people love baseball. But, but in the 19th century, in some ways, it was also just, it was this easy thing to do. You just need a field and, and a stick and something round, you know. So, so it, it really grew in Cuba. And it was actually Cuba that spread baseball to Latin America, not the United States. Um, so yeah. in a way, the United States obviously was part of that because, sure. you know, that's where they learned it. But it was Cuba that really exported the game into the rest of Latin America. Um, and, you know, it's still uh, it, it, baseball is still so important in Cuba. Um, I was actually a very uh, uh, fortunate um, two years ago in November, I gave a, a paper in Havana about lefty. It had been a lifelong dream of mine to go to Havana uh, or to go to Cuba. And yeah. I was able to go and we watched some baseball while we were there. So it's still just extremely important. Yeah, that is great. So here's a 15-year-old a uh, young woman who has never left Cuba. My guess has never been on a plane. No, never. And, <laughs> and, and walking up the steps to, uh, to a, a new life in America. Yep. Talk, talk to us about that that journey. Well, um, first of all, they uh, the the members of the uh, All Americans who were from outside the U.S. There were four Cuban women who played, but there were a number of Canadians who played, and so those women. Part of their contract was that in the off season they had to return home. So when the season ended, Lefty had to return to Cuba, and she did that for the first few years that she was uh, playing. Um, <clears throat> but um, so she wasn't completely removed from Cuba, I guess is my point. But um, she remembers, um, uh, she said, I didn't even know we, we, we got to Chicago, and all I remember were these really tall buildings. And um, some people met her. Uh, they had to. They flew in, and then she had to take a train to where she was staying. And um, some people met her at the train station with a coat. She had never had a coat before. Um, and so these were the people that would end up being her host. And she stayed with a host family. Um, her first experience was this. It was almost this childlike and. And she was basically a child, but it was this childlike just belief that it was going to be OK. You know, I'm, I'm a ball player. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a ball player. And that's this great thing. And my mother wants me to do this. But then once she got here, it also became um, it became a challenge because communication was very difficult. She tried desperately to learn English and, and she did. Um, uh, but it was hard. And she remembers she couldn't really order food um, in the restaurants when they would stop. And so she learned to say just a few things like she could say hamburger or, you know, something. And so she that's all she ate because that's what she could say. Um, and other players certainly helped her out. Um, the other three Cuban players uh, were uh, one in particular was very close to Lefty and they they roomed together. And so she spoke more English and that gave um, that gave Lefty a little bit of an opportunity to, to ease in. Um, but the one thing Lefty has always been clear about is that I couldn't speak the language. I didn't understand what was going on until I was on a baseball field. Um, and when I was on a baseball field, I understood Right. We, we could communicate because we were speaking the language of baseball. And and that's, you know, that's how she survived. I mean, I know that sounds it sounds ridiculous and maybe it sounds corny, but it's real. Um, I, and, and I don't know that it sounds ridiculous at all. And I, I imagine that that's probably the experience of 
of uh, some of the men, for example, that have come from China or Japan, played uh, sure. some Japanese players playing ba uh, baseball, right. some of the Chinese players playing playing basketball and so forth. Um, of course. Uh, although this day and age with professional sports teams, there's got so much money, there, there's so yeah. much side and so forth, uh, right. a different era. Um, so, uh, so, so what position did she play and how good was she? Lefty was a pitcher. Um, she played some other positions too, but she was primarily a pitcher. Um, Lefty was a good ball player. Lefty was not a great ball player. Um, and part of that, I think, was her age. Um, and, and just the, the not really fitting in and not feeling comfortable. Um, but when she joined the all Americans, she joined a professional baseball league and those players were good. They were really good. Um, lefty, um, in fact, um, I knew lefty for a long time before I, I asked her to write this book and, and she kept, for the longest time, she kept saying, no, 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 you don't want to write a book about me. I wasn't even that good. I'm not a star. And, and I said, yeah, but that's exactly why we need to know your story. Um, most of us are not stars, right? I mean, most of us that play ball, we're not stars. We didn't become, we didn't go to college and play. We didn't, we didn't become professional, but we know what baseball means and we know what baseball means to us. And you represent that. And she eventually agreed to let me write her story, not because she was a superstar, but, but, but because um, despite that fact, uh, baseball saved her life. Uh, baseball saved her life on more than one occasion. Now, and did, it was important to her. How did you become acquainted with her? I'm sorry. How did you become acquainted with her? Well, um, the uh, the uh, for many years, the All Americans um, had uh, and still have uh, what they call a players' association. And for years and years, every year they would have a reunion, and um, and they would have these all around the country in different places. And if you were, a, you could become an associate member of that organization. And if you were a member, you could attend these reunions. Um, and so in 2003, um, that was introduced to me uh, by Tim Wiles, who was the archivist at, the, at Cooperstown, the Baseball Hall of Fame. And he said, oh, you, you know, go, oh, these women are great. You'll meet them. They love talking to you. Um, and, and I did. And it was uh, September 2003. The reu it happened to be their 60th anniversary reunion. Um, I walked into the lobby of a hotel full of a uh, bunch of gray haired old women who were talking and laughing and, and just it, unbelievable. Um, and so it was there uh, that I first met Lefty and uh, and we became friends over the years. Um, those women, uh, that experience is one I will never forget. In fact, uh, after about an hour standing in that lobby, um, I went out uh, back up to my room and I called home and I said, you know, those moments where you're pretty sure something just happened that's going to change your life forever. Um, I think I just had that. And I was right. My life has never been, has not been the same since. Well, that's fascinating. What a great story. Now, t tell us a little bit about the league. I guess this is uh, perhaps the story that was told in the movie. But for those sure. of us who maybe didn't see it or or wondering if the movie reflected reality, what, what actually uh, did take place? Okay, first of all, if there are people out there who haven't seen the movie, please don't tell me. Um, this is, if you have not seen the movie A League of Their Own, you need to run right now and go watch it. Well, when we're done here. Um, the, uh, the movie A League of Their Own came out in 1992. Uh, as most people know, Penny Marshall was the director. Um, the, the women of that league had pretty much just kind of languished in obscurity um, until that point. In fact, those women tell the story all the time of, of throughout the years from 54 when the league ended until the movie came out, they would say to friends or whatever, you know, I played professional baseball. Oh no, you didn't. You mean softball? No, I mean baseball. I mean, people didn't even believe them when they told it. So when the movie came out, they had this newfound, um, notoriety and well-deserved, well-deserved. And so almost to a person, the, the women that I've talked to love that movie. 
They believe it does a good job of, of, of telling the story. There are a few things that they are never happy with. For one, and this comes up every single conversation, um, a man would never have been in the locker room. So the scenes where Tom Hanks comes into the locker room, that's the thing that upsets them. Um, and, you know, so, but basically they would say probably 90% or so accurate. Um, and the, the league started um, uh, in 1943. Philip Wrigley, who was the uh, owner of the Cubs and also the uh, uh, Wrigley Chewing Gum, um, started the league in part because a lot of the men had gone off to war. We were at the beginning of World War II. And he and some of the owners realized they were going to lose some money. Um, and their minor league teams were pretty much just not playing. Uh, and they, women's softball at the time in the Midwest was extremely popular. And so they had the idea, let's start this league. Uh, and the first year they played softball. Um, but um, they, so they started uh, with the, the uh, with four teams. The first game was May 30th, 1943. And, um, you know, Wrigley kind of, after a year or so, Wrigley was, you know, he was kind of done with it. Um, uh, but his advertising guy, uh, Meyerhoff, took over, and he is the one who really built the league. Um, that league lasted until 1954. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's amazing. Um, over around 600 women over the course of that period played in the league. And um, almost every single one I've ever talked to said it was the most important time in their lives. And um, they were playing baseball and they were getting paid for it. And uh, they traveled. They experienced things they would never have experienced. Um, and, and so that league did an amazing, uh, did amazing things for those women. Many of them took that money and became, went to college and they sent siblings to college and it, 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 is a, um, it is a testament to the importance of access to sports. And how, how popular was it with fans and how many teams were there? Um, it started out with four teams. It got up to 11. Um, and, and, and I think, um, you know, it, it, was, it was very popular. Um, it's hard to know exactly. They didn't keep fan attendance maybe quite like we do today. Uh, but I know, for example, the Rockford Peaches were probably one of the most attended. Uh, they had a few games that reached around 5,000 fans, but I think more on average, it was probably around 2,000, 2,500, you know, something along those lines. And it varied. I mean, that's not an exact number. Um, in uh, 19, I think it was 49, uh, the league drew almost a million fans. Um, that year. I mean, it was very popular. And, you know, I think people started watching it initially because it was a novelty, you know, are, are those women out there playing? Um, but then they very quickly, very quickly um, uh, realized that those are good ball players, And those women were good ball ballplayers. Um, and so it was a popular league. The teams uh, had very loyal fans. And uh, and they continued to be loyal. Those fans continued to be loyal even after the league ended. I see. Well, how long how long did Lefty play? How how long into her career? And, and what did she? What was then the transition like from baseball to uh, life in America after baseball? Yeah, Lefty um, injured her knee um, in '53, I think it was, uh, and so she really. Uh, was unable to play through most of that um, that last year. Um, but from 49 to roughly 54, but then there were some gaps, you know, from injury and, and other things. Um, when the league ended, Lefty was lost. Um, she uh, went through a very, very difficult time. She had a hard time finding a job. Again, she had a sixth grade education. Um, she basically didn't, um, didn't know about, um, you know, she tried to go to school and, and learn, uh, English and she tried to get her GED and that didn't work. 
She found out much later, and, and I believe this is true, that she likely had a learning disability. And I think that really made this even more difficult. Unfortunately, though, she became, uh, she started to drink and um, she she drank a lot. And, and I think there were times when um, she was driving and shouldn't have. And she tells a story about one time going off the road into a cornfield. Um, and she just kind of drove around the cornfield and back up onto the back up onto the road. You know, it just, it, it, I mean, she just she really was sort of out of control. But she did get a job working on the assembly line at the General Electric plant in Fort Wayne. And that Fort Wayne was where she played. And that's where she ended up staying. Um, and so she ended up working at GE until she retired. I think she was there over 30 years. Um, she eventually quit drinking and got herself together um, around the late 80s. And that is when the women of the All-Americans decided to try to find one another again. Um, and they started to have uh, smaller reunions. They had their first reunion. I believe it was 1988, but I, I'm, I'm not going to swear to that date. But I, I think it was 1988. Um, and it was in Chicago and Lefty uh, told me, I realized um, I needed to be my best self because that's my team. Those are my teammates. And so she really worked on getting herself in a better shape. And so when she rediscovered those women, when she reconnected with baseball, um, life became very different for her. And she was always active in the organization, always active in planning reunions and being at reunions. And she was constantly, after the movie came out, she was constantly in parades and all kinds of things. And so again, baseball saved her, you know? And, and so um, she, Lefty did not have an easy life. Um, and definitely did not. But I think if she could, she would tell you today that she had a lucky one. And you said that uh, she felt the the uh, the best day or the day she was proudest. I'm, I'm sorry. Say again. I, I believe you you mentioned earlier that she felt like the, the day she uh, was the, the, the proudest or the best day of her life was when she became an American citizen. Um, she stayed with a, a family in Fort Wayne whose last name were the uh, Blee. Um, and they became family to her and they were responsible for getting her a green card. And it was when they did that, that she had, she could stop going back to Cuba in the off season. Uh, and then they were the ones who helped her get a job. Um, and then also helped her become an American citizen. Um, and she has said to me many times, um, you know, without baseball, I wouldn't be an American citizen. And, and, you know, one of her, I mean, this is a woman who had a sixth grade education. She could barely read English and she studied and she became an American citizen. And what that, the, the difficulty of that and the, the, the strength that that took and the, this, the determination um, is an indication of the, the person she is. And um, so, yeah, that was her. That was one of her crowning or her proudest moments. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, let's let's bring back in Carrie and uh, mm -hmm. see what questions we have perhaps from from viewers. Sure. All right. So we have a question from a viewer. They would like to understand what the recruitment process was. How did they publicize the tryouts and things like mm -hmm. that? Sure. Um, that varied from place to place. But basically, one of the things that they did was they had um, scouts that would go out and watch uh, women playing ball, whether it was softball or baseball or whatever. Um, so they had scouts that went out. But the other thing was they put ads in the paper. Uh, one of the women who I became uh, close friends with, um, uh, her nickname was Beans. Um, she found a little bitty ad in a Hess, Oklahoma newspaper uh, that they were holding tryouts. And she uh, she didn't have the money for the, for the train tickets. So the town took up money and gave her money to go try out. 
Um, so the the um, it was in newspapers. They would send flyers out. They were um, they were recruiting primarily in the Midwest, not exclusively, but primarily in the Midwest. Okay, and then they were recruiting, as you had said, in Cuba, in Canada. That's right. Was there any particular reason for that, or just they recruited wherever they played? Well, um, the, the, the Cuban part, and I know more about that than the Canadian part, but the, the Cuban piece of it was that uh, Meyerhoff um, um, really thought and believed that they could start um, an expansion or a, or a league in Latin America, that was, uh, they wanted to grow this league. And so, and so the first thing the first to do was to, you know, uh, rec go there. And so in 47, they went for spring training and then they had an exhibition tour. They played in um, Nicaragua and El Salvador. And, and so there, it really came initially because they wanted to expand the league. Um, and and so that that was it was a business thing that ended up not happening, but but it started there. OK, great. Um, how common was it that women faced the realities of war as depicted in the movie with Betty Spaghetti when she found out that her husband had died? Yeah, unfortunately, I think it was common. Um, I do not know statistics about the number of women who who suffered um, in that way. Um, but remember, a number of these women were um, too young to have been married at the time. Um, and uh, the league, much of the league happened after the war. Um, so, um, but it did happen. And, and a number, I know a few of the players who's, uh, who lost brothers, for example. Um, and that was like more likely uh, because of their ages. Right. Okay. All right. Well, this has been a treat. Thank you so much. We've learned a lot tonight. Great. And great. We have so great. Thank you. We have a link to Kat's book in the chat um, and on our website. And of course, as always, there's so much more in the book to learn than we were able to cover tonight. So check that out and give that book um, a look. And also we'll put a a link in the chat to the International Women's Baseball Center, so you can check thank that you. out as well. Thank you. All right. We would like to thank the James and Edith Spain Foundation for supporting the pursuit of history. And to find out how you can support the pursuit of history or join as a member, you can go to thepursuitofhistory.org. Um, we've been talking about an event that is coming up in May that has actually been moved to July. If you sign up on our email list at historycamp.org, you will get the announcement this Saturday and be in on all the news as it's released. Next week, April 8th, we will be speaking with Dr. Francis Brimmer about the Puritans. We're going to dispel some of our commonly held myths about them. So you'll want to join us for that. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.